Hi, Charles is a book sage here, and this is another episode of my Harry Potter first time reread series. Today I am discussing chapters 13 through 16 of the Goblet of Fire. Mad-Eyed Moody, The Unforgivable Curse, Bobatons, and Durmstrang, and The Goblet of Fire. So, chapter 13, Mad-Eye Moody. It is the first day of actual classes now, uh, the start of their semester. And this is always a fun chapter in the books when we get to see, um, we get a little snippet of each class that they're taking and who their teachers are. And they're continuing pretty much the same curriculum as they had last year as they're working, I think, towards owls eventually. If I have that, I think owls and then newts and things like that later. So we get to see Professor Sprout and Herbology. We get to see Professor Trelawney and Divination, uh, which I always enjoy the Divination chapters. Professor Trelawney is one of my favorites in the school. And we, of course, get Hagrid and Care of Magical Creatures. And those are always interesting and entertaining because you never know what kind of strange creature that's probably way too dangerous to be around uh, they're going to be taken care of in their class. And then what's interesting here is we see Hermione um, just shoveling her food down as quick as she can and then off to the library. And you get you realize she's working on something and it doesn't seem to be really uh, classroom homework related at this point. So she's diving herself into a project, which if you were paying attention in the chapters leading up to this and how um, outraged she is at the treatment of the house elves, it's not too hard to figure out she's looking into that whole situation. Um, but the real meat of this chapter is uh, it's dinner time. They meet back up. They're going into, the, I guess, the Great Hall to eat. And there's Draco. And Draco has the Daily Prophet. And there's a story in there about Ron's father, where he's gotten in some sort of trouble with helping out Mad-Eyed Moody and cops got involved and things. But we see again, yet again, um, Draco Malfoy really going after Ron Weasley. Uh, it's one of the things that stood out the most to me so far as I'm doing this first time reread is just how much Draco really dislikes Ron and really goes after Ron way more than he goes after Harry. He and Harry have a kind of a rivalry, but he has a real visceral dislike of Ron. And I wonder, like, what is that and where does that come from? Because he really, really, I mean, he's extremely insulting here to Ron's mother. And we get really interesting is they Harry insults him back and they turn to leave and Draco actually attacks them but just as Mad-Eye Moody walks in and we get a look at Mad-Eye Moody and what he's like and he transforms Malfoy into the ferret and he's throwing them all over the place and <laughs> it's for those who don't like Draco it's a probably a fun really um, payoff moment to see uh, this at this point in this whole series. But it also speaks to a great introduction really to Mad-Eye uh, and what he's like in that he doesn't really follow rules and he does his own thing. And uh, it's a really intriguing moment in this book to see that this is the new defense against the dark arts teacher and he's kind of a bit wild and really unpredictable and doesn't like to conform and we'll see how that plays into the events that happen and again a quick chapter just that basic introduction it's first day it's back into the swing of things but um a really really interesting dynamic there um between the students between um a really, really interesting dynamic there to watch those events unfold. Chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses. This is a uh, one of my favorite chapters so far in this book. And it's a scene that they did a really good job in, in the movies. Uh, after hearing uh, in the earlier part of the week about Mad-Eye Moody and how he teaches defense against the dark arts, 
Thursday rolls around and it's finally Harry, Ron, and Hermione's time to have that class. And in walks Mad-Eye Moody and he does not disappoint. And we learn that Dumbledore and he had decided that it's time to teach them things that they normally wouldn't learn till like year six. And that's how to defend against other wizards, against curses and, and spells like that. And then he introduces them to the unforgivable curses. Imperius, Cruciatus, and Avada Kedavra. And he does them each one of these on these three spiders. And it's a great introduction. A new, you know, yet again, it's like our third introduction to Mad-Eye Moody, really. Uh, and seeing him in action in this class and how serious he's taking it and how the importance of what he's trying to drive home to these kids about this is not a game, this is real life, and this is what could happen to you. It's really effectively done by Rowling. And we get to see an interesting moment for both Harry and Neville. Uh, we see Neville react strangely to the Cruciatus curse. Neville actually raised his hand and gave that answer as one of the unforgivable curses. And we also see how Harry deals with Avada Kedavra. Because as he's watching Mad-Eye Moody kill the spider, he realizes that's how my parents died, just like that spider did. And I guess it's kind of a really unsettling moment for him to see that curse in action. And again, him being the only one who survived it. Um, but really, really well done and just a good, good start to this class and what they're going to be learning. And I like that Moody comes out and like he paid attention that Neville was deeply impacted by the Cruciatus curse and has him kind of stay back. And Hermione again, off she goes to the library. And Ron and Harry are sitting there uh, in the, the common room uh, in Gryffindor, and they're trying to do their divination homework. Can't figure it out, so they just, well, let's just make it all up. <laughs> Which uh, is always entertaining, the things that they come up with. And Hermione finally comes back from the library, and she's finished her project. She's decided to start a new society, um, SPEW, which Ron keeps just saying spew. And it's the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare. As she begins her crusade to change the enslavement lifestyle of the elves, we also get Hedwig coming and finally returning uh, after his trip to take his letter to Sirius. And Sirius has a quick little note that he sent back about how he's coming north now. And Dumbledore's been reading the signs, and they have no idea what's going on. But Harry gets really mad, and now he regrets telling Sirius about his scar hurting. Because now he's afraid that Sirius is going to come north and get himself caught and thrown back in Azkaban. It's going to be Harry's fault. And Harry goes to bed pretty much angry. But um, another really good, like, sort of setup chapter to this book. We're still... Uh, early on, um, it feels like we're still early on here because we've only now just gotten to school, even though it is 227 pages in <laughs> and we're just the beginning of school still, which is a stark contrast between uh, the particularly the first couple of books where at this page where we're nearing the finale in the original first book. And the story's still barely beginning here in this one. Um, but just, I really liked this chapter. I really liked Mad-Eye Moody. And interesting, the dynamic mention, too, that the students notice uh, about Snape and how Snape doesn't, or Snape is really careful around Mad-Eye Moody. Because normally Snape would not hide his displeasure at the dark arts teacher having his, the job he wants and covets. But with Mad-Eye Moody, he treads very, very lightly <laughs> because 
He, he knows what Mad-Eye Moody is like. And it's interesting, too, to think that this really isn't Mad-Eye Moody, though. It's, you know, it's someone posing as him. I imagine he's already in place at this point. Because only because of the original shot of Mad-Eye Moody in the first day of school with a sorting hat when he was came in and he was sitting there and he was drinking out of the flask. You would assume that it's already um, Crouch with uh, the Polyjuice Potion. But we'll see. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's, he's been, hasn't been Mad-Eye Moody in this whole time here. So it's an interesting kind of thing about this um, character is, is this what Mad-Eye Moody is like anyway? Did Crouch just spend a lot of time studying him and getting his mannerisms? Or did Crouch just kind of come up with this himself, with some of this Crouch? Uh, and just figuring Moody's been in isolation for so long, none of these people are really going to know. But I imagine he must have spent a lot of time studying him so that he'd be able to fool people like the other teachers who do know him. But it's always an interesting kind of thing here that uh, that this isn't really him. Chapter 15, Bobatons and Durmstrang. So one of the things that Harry and the others are learning as fourth year students is the workload that they get, the amount of schoolwork they get. Um, it takes a big step up. The owls are still not until the end of the fifth year, but they're already now beginning to prepare them for those tests. And their workload is just ballooning, mushrooming up. And which, of course, doesn't bother Hermione. That's right up her alley. But um, it can put, I guess, strain on the students who, you know, may not, maybe they weren't expecting this. I don't know. But we get some interesting... Um, Defense Against the Dark Arts stuff here, too, where um, Mad-Eye Moody says that Dumbledore wants him to actually perform the Imperial Curse on each of the students in the class to teach them what it feels like to have that spell done to you and to teach them how to begin to uh, combat against it, how to try to overcome that curse. And it's interesting that Harry seems to have like an innate talent to be able to do that. Not completely at first, but he's the only one of the students in the classroom who is able to resist at all. And by the end of the first class, I think he's pretty much got it down that he's able to resist it. Mainly because the moment Matt I. Moody saw he could, he just kept using him <laughs> as the, um, his partner to show people. But um, the Defenses Against the Dark Arts chapter is already here. This is only our second chapter of this, but they're already more intense than they have been in the previous uh, three books. But um, we also get Hermione beginning or continuing her campaign for the house elves. And I like the exchange between her and George where George is asks her, have you even gone down to the kitchens? Have you even gone and talked to them to see what they do? And his, his point of view, and, and a lot of the other students who don't really want to think about this stuff, is they enjoy what they do. And to Hermione, it's like, if this is all they know, that's not a fair assessment. That it's wrong for them to not be free. That they should be paid a salary to do the things that they're doing. It shouldn't be their life. So she's beginning to kind of put pressure on the other students to, you know, you can't ignore this. I'm not going to let you ignore this. Which is commendable to her and her character that she has this passion and is intent on getting people to face things that they just really, really don't want to face. It's easier to ignore this stuff, to pretend it's not really there because they do their chores, if you will, um, not being noticed. It's part of their um, 
what they do is they, they, they intentionally are able to do all these things without you even knowing they're really there. And I think that's part of what also drives Hermione is not only are they slaves, but they're slaves who aren't even allowed to be seen. So you get to pretend that they're not really there, that they're, these things just happen and they're just taken care of. And that it's, you don't have to have the reminder in your face visually that there's someone who's not free doing these chores for you. And Hermione is determined to, to change that and force them to be aware of it, force them to face it, which is good. But the main part of this chapter is the end, where it's the day before Halloween now, and the students uh, are coming from Bobaton School and from Durmstrang School, a little pretzel. <laughs> and um, I like how each one arrives, the sort of gigantic horse carriage, and we, we meet the headmistress of Bobaton who seems to be as, who's like as big as Hagrid. She seems to have some giantess blood. And then we see those students, and they're... And then afterwards, the ship comes up out of the lake, which I remember that being how they arrived in the movies. I don't particularly remember a giant house-sized... Um, horse carriage, horse-drawn carriage coming down and like kind of bouncing on the ground. Well, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, so um, that may be how she, uh, how the, the Bobotons arrive in the movie, too. I just can't remember. Um, but the most interesting thing here is we get hints that, okay, Cedric Diggory is expected to be probably Hogwarts's champion. And we see Victor Crum uh, ha is part of the Durmstrang students. And you got know, obviously, he's going to end up being the Durmstrang's champion to participate. And that's how this chapter ends. And it's interesting to see, this is a, uh, an interesting moment because we got to see some of, um, I guess, students from the other schools at the try at the um, Quidditch World Cup, but this is the first time we're getting to see them also as fellow students rather than just people at a sporting event. So it's interesting now to see where, how this is. I'm really looking forward to this because um, again, it's been quite a while since I read this book, and I only read it that once. And uh, I, I, re I remember really, really enjoying reading the tournament itself and all the challenges and the events. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to play now. Especially because I've seen the movie a bunch of times. And one of the things that I've been discovering with this reread is that a lot of my memories of the story are really movie versions of events. And not the book version. So it's nice to like, sort of rediscover parts of this story um, by rereading it for this first time ever reread. Uh, it, it's fun. It's almost like rediscovering the story in a way uh, because I'm, it's pushing aside the movie versions that I remember and re rediscovering the book versions. That's pretty much it for that chapter. It's very straightforward. To the point. Chapter 16, Goblet of Fire. So now that the students from the two schools have arrived, in they come in uh, to the Great Hall, and there's a big feast in their honor to welcome them. And the Bobotons go and sit with the Ravenclaws. The Durmstrangs go and sit with the Slytherins. And there's a big feast, and we get to see Ron sees Fleur Delacour, who's very, like, Vila-like, and he's just completely just awestruck and dumbstruck whenever she comes over and takes the, like, bouillabaisse um, soup or broth or whatever it is. But we learn then, finally, that there's a goblet of fire, a literal goblet of fire, 
uh, where the if you want to enter the tournament, you write your name and your school down and you put it in the goblet. And there's a 24-hour period where you can put your name in and then it'll choose from the names in the cup. And off they go to bed. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And then the next morning, everyone's up early. You have... Fred and George and their friend Lee have figured out um, they've got an aging potion that will age them enough to be the required age. So they've taken that and they step across the line and for a moment it looks like they're going to be successful and then they're they're shot back and then sprout these big white beards. And then there's Dumbledore like chuckling behind them and I always get a kick out of how much Dumbledore really enjoys Fred and George. He really seems to enjoy their antics and how um, much fun they have. And it's always a nice little touch that you see throughout some of the books. And uh, rather than just being, you know, angry about it. And Fred and George and Lee all think it's hysterical that they've all got these white beards now and have to go off to, I guess, Madame Pomfrey's to get them unaged. <laughs> But it's just a fun little scene. But we get, after that, we finally get our Ron, Hermione, and Harry going to visit Hagrid in his cottage. And those scenes are always uh, some of my favorites, too. Where it's just, it's kind of their little escape. Where they all just get to sit and relax and talk. and, And they're always really comforting scenes in the books for the most part and Hagrid of course is something's weird with him he's wearing his sort of suit and he's slicked his hair and trying to make it look good and he's got a weird tie on but an interesting one of the interesting parts about this scene with, at Hagrid's is Hermione trying to convince Hagrid to become a member of her SPEW to liberate the house elves and Hagrid's yet another one who says this is their life this is what they enjoy you might have a few of them who would want freedom but most of them don't want to change their lives which is just something Hermione just like can't accept um so but it, it's it's an interesting the way Rowling's presenting this as if um you know, they find Hermione strange that she would want people to be free. But it's getting close to the feast again, Halloween. There's going to be another feast. And off they go. And we realize that Hagrid, he's all dressed up the way he is because he's smitten by Madame Maxine. But it's up to the Great Hall. And the feast is finally over. And it's time for the Triwizard Champions to be chosen by the goblet itself. So the goblet spits out a name. And Dumbledore catches it. And obviously Victor Crumb. The next name, um, Flor Delacour. She's going to be the Bobaton Champion. And Ron and Harry and Hermione are hoping that Angela Johnson, who is a member of Gryffindor and I think on their Quidditch team, is going to be chosen for Hogwarts, but it ends up being Cedric, Cedric Diggory from Hufflepuff. And then, as Dumbledore is speaking and about to wrap the whole thing up so the tournament can start, the cup spits out another name, and it's Harry Potter. And that's how the chapter ends. (laughs) And I remember when I read this the first time, you know, I was... I thought it was done really well, and it makes sense. It wasn't, I don't, can't remember if it was a surprise to me that his name would come out. I think once Ced- Cedric was chosen, I didn't expect um, Harry to be in the tournament itself. Though I expected he would somehow become involved in something to do with it. Uh, so I think it was a bit more of a surprise because it was a fourth name rather than just him instead of Cedric. Uh, It's hard to remember because, again, it's been such a while. 
but I like this chapter. I like these set of chapters. You know, we, we get to see these other students from these other schools. Um, the tournament itself, Fred and George stuff, is always, I, there's never enough Fred and George in these books for me, personally. <laughs> but I know it's Harry's story and not theirs. But uh, a good set of chapters getting us all the way up to this big reveal, this big surprise, like shocker moment of somehow Harry Potter's name has gotten into that cup and he's been chosen as the fourth champion, which should be impossible. And now all the setup's done. And from here on, we get into the meat of the story, the actual tournament itself and everything that's going to happen. But overall, uh, this is the hardcover I'm reading, so it's... 271 pages to get to this point and still not halfway through getting closer to the halfway point but I really really am impressed by this whole opening uh, of this book from the first moment to this moment here where Harry Potter's name pops out of the cup it's just really really well written and it's such a stark difference from the very first book like I think I mentioned earlier in that <clears throat> there's there's just more in depth uh, happening here and it, it's still nice and quickly paced you would think that a book that's what's probably like seven hundred plus pages would move slower than a 200 or like a 300 page book but it doesn't these 271 pages have just flown by and I think that's one of the strengths of this series is that it the at least through book four it still moves at a nice quick pace I'm really curious when I do get to the next book because that's the one that I just remember there being that one section where it just felt like it was a little too monotonous and went on too long. So I'm really curious about how that's going to read to me when I do get to it. But so far, I mean, these 271 pages, even though I'm taking my time, they've just story-wise, reading-wise, have just flown by. You know, you don't even realize that it's that many pages just to get to this moment. And I'm really, really looking forward now to the, the actual tournament um, and how it's going to read this time around. Because, again, I'm so used to just the movie version. Uh, so, but yeah, not a lot of... This is mostly just kind of getting you up to this moment of... Um, So we can start the, so we can start the tournament. I'm curious to see if any of the things that are in here uh, are going to play a role. Are these weird, magical creatures that they're studying with Hagrid? Are they going to play a role in this particular story? I can't remember if it's just in there for comical relief or if they actually are pertinent to this. What happens in this book? So that's, the, I guess, one of the beauties of having only read it once many years ago. Uh, there are little things like that. Some of these things that foreshadowing I notice and other parts of the foreshadowing I don't notice yet because this is only my second time reading them. And again, I'm a little, my memory is more distorted by the movies rather than the books. So, but fun, fun stuff. So next week, it is going to be chapters 17, 18, 19, and 20. The Four Champions, The Weighing of the Wands, The Hungarian Horntail, and The First Task. So, and I'm really looking forward to um, getting into this tournament. And it's interesting to think that there's still so much of this story in this book still to come. The tournament itself, I think, covers quite a few chapters. And like we haven't even gotten to read a Skeeter or any of that stuff yet, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be a fun fun read. But again, this was mostly just a couple of chapters 
just getting us through things we had to get through to set the stage for the tournament. So we'll see how that goes next week. So not really a lot to to say about these chapters other than just the specific events that happened in them, really. So that's it for this week. Not really a lot of in-depth stuff for these chapters because there are more are just things that needed to happen to get us to the start of the tournament rather than you know I don't, I don't, I don't remember yet if anything in here is specific foreshadowing for anything so I'll see as the story goes but that's it for this week I will see you again next week for those four chapters where we start to get into the tournament itself and I am Charles' Book Sage Happy reading.